Let's get into it. Let's get into it, right, Casey? You know, we've been watching you online, you know, social media, the the knee injury. Just give us a little bit of background of uh, how did that all come together, the knee injury? I know you've talked about it a little bit, but just give us a little story. Yeah, so basically I accepted my fight against Jessica I, which was supposed to be July 2nd, and I think I was like three months out of uh, the fight. So I had a long camp once again. And I was just kind of like slowly getting into the swing of things. And it was actually maybe my second sparring session since I heard about the fight. And uh, I was at the gym and just sparring with another girl who I always spar with. Um, she went for a takedown and I was up against the fence. And the way that my knee fell sort of made my knee go backwards and like hyperextend. And I just heard this super loud pop. And I thought no way that was me like I've never heard anything like that so I didn't think it was me but um 30 seconds later my whole leg started burning I tried to stand up I fell over and I realized like pretty quickly that something was going on with my knee and I headed over to the PI and they seemed to be pretty worried with it too the next morning I ended up getting an MRI and finding out that I had completely tore my ACL so that was a like a big bummer for me but I still really wanted to fight so I kept trying for a week to find any doctor that would sign off on me fighting and find a way to make it work but uh, unfortunately everybody sort of came together and said there's no way that I could do it that I needed to go in for surgery as soon as possible and yeah I think I got surgery almost nine weeks ago now we're in eight and a half weeks so I'm just dealing with that and uh, starting to come out the other side of you know starting to use my leg again and everything so we're getting to a good spot again but it was rough there for a couple of months yeah i know that you're a you're a busy body which means that you like to move you'd like to do something right and sitting around not doing much i know you're i know you're probably doing something that's not involving your knee just to keep active what were you doing during that time Actually, the PI has been great for me, um, having people that know what they're talking about and have gone through a million previous ACLs in MMA. So I felt pretty confident with them. I actually ended up going into physical therapy. I think I had surgery on the Wednesday and I went on to physical ther therapy on the Friday. So I had two days and then I started doing physical therapy on my knee straight away. We took all the bandages off. We took the brace off. We started moving my knee a lot. And I've really just been focused on doing that and getting my leg as strong as possible so that when I come back, I'm even stronger than I was before I hurt my ACL. So a lot of strength and conditioning and a lot of uh, physical therapy every day. I think I'm doing like three or four hours a day on just improving my knee and uh, not really allowed to do too much else yet. I haven't been signed off on doing anything. So I'm trying to just listen to them and take it slow so that I don't have to go through this again because as you said I am very much a busy body and it has been like super hard to not be in the gym I think I can't remember the last time I ever had three months off training so I, I'm dying to get punched in the face right now <laughs> not many people are going to say that right I'm dying yeah, to get punched I in the face <laughs> like just to get my little sister who's here right now to punch me in the face so I can feel alive some days you know yeah was the pain worse before or after the surgery um, so immediately after it doesn't really hurt. It's just sort of like was this burning pain and instability in my knee. And then I think the next day I was in quite a bit of pain and just felt like I really couldn't put any weight at all on my leg. Like every time I tried to take a step, I would basically fall over. So that's when I knew that it was something pretty serious. But I think my body started to like adjust and not let myself feel too much pain so it wasn't too painful beforehand and uh after surgery they had you on some pretty strong meds so i wasn't too bad i ended up actually getting sick like two days after surgery so the pain was nothing compared to just like dying of the flu on the couch um but that went away after five days i can't say i felt too much pain it's more so instability like learning to balance learning to walk again learning to bend again um other than the pi grabbing my knee and like moving it around for me nothing's really been too painful so far they usually give you like a timeline a uh, timeline for recovery or rehab right where are you at are you hitting all the the right markers um for the most part yes yeah. so i'm like 
nine weeks on Wednesday. So I've got two more days and I'll be at nine weeks. And this is sort of like the introduction to running phase again. So I hit everything pretty early, like fast. And now they're trying to slow me down because obviously I want to go crazy. I want to start jumping on things. I want to start, you know, sparring again and everything. And they're like, slow down. You can't go that fast. So yeah, I think I'm right where I need to be. And I would be doing a lot more if I could, but obviously I've got to listen to them. So this next two months, I'll start being able to do some MMA stuff, I think. So I can't wait for that. Do you feel like you're learning to be more uh, patient no. in, throughout this whole process? No, you haven't. No, not at all. Ask anybody. I'm the same. I'm really struggling with it. Everyone's like, you're fine. I'm like, I'm not. I just want to train. So mm -hmm. I've like sat down on a seat and hit the bag with no knee movement i've sat down on a seat and punched the bag i've rode the bike for an hour i've sat in the sauna for so long you know i do everything that i can do and uh, i do it for as long as i possibly can with them so um, everybody thinks i'm crazy but i'm never going to change this is just the way i am i love to train and i love to train hard and that's what really makes me feel like fulfilled so i guess you could say that i'm learning patience a little bit but in terms of like being okay with slowing down, I'm never okay with that. I've been struggling for sure with that. All right, all right. Well, I guess maybe you're better at managing it, you know, rather than. You I know. guess I hide it a little bit better yeah. now. So, yeah. All right, all right. Um, you know, uh, you can't fight, but you can always, you know, interact with fans. And I saw you that International Fight Week was pretty big. How was that for you? Meeting just just fans on top of fans, just lining up. Fight week was awesome, you know, I went to that UFC Expo for the first time and uh, I didn't actually know it when I was doing it, but this was the first one since before COVID, so they hadn't had it for a long time, so obviously people were going crazy and like so excited to be there, and uh, I was so excited to be there, you know, I wanted to be a part of U fight week, I was going to fight and I was going to entertain the fans, but the next best thing is still meeting all the fans and still being a part of it. So being at UFC X was awesome. Signing things for people, getting to know some people, even recognizing some fans that had traveled out to my fight in Houston and then made it back to get me to sign something else, you know, and remembering them. So it's pretty awesome, like building a little fan base and getting to see them and sign things for them and just making their fight week even, even better for them, you know. What does that do for you, though, like meeting fans and maybe hearing like certain stories? You know, what I mean, every fan has a, a connection to you. So what, what does that feel like emotionally? It's nice, you know, so I got booed in my last fight. So I'm like, oh, everybody, you know, hates me. But when you actually sit back and you look at it, that everybody is supporting me and everybody that came to see me asked about my knee, asked how I'm doing, obviously follows my journey. And uh, I appreciate that because you're nothing without the fans in this sport you know we do the we fight because we love it but then we also fight because we love entertaining people and you know i love that my story is sticking with people and that people are following my journey and it definitely saved my feelings on uh fight week i was struggling with you know meant to be in a fight week and meant to be fighting and everything but everybody coming to me and just telling me can't wait to see you fight again you know keep killing recovery and that they're all watching uh, made it a lot better you were supposed to fight uh, Jessica I. You mentioned that earlier at UFC 276 during International Fight Week. And uh, that fight didn't work out. Macy Barber steps in, gets the win. Jessica I retires. You know, retirement is a, a tricky thing in MMA. Did you think it was the right time for her? I mean, I can't say what the right time is for somebody else. You know, I'm sure that she thinks it's the right time for her. And that's all that matters. You got to put your health first. And if your head isn't in the game anymore, then I really do believe that you should retire. And I think that the only time you think about retirement is if your head isn't in the game. So, yeah, I think she stepped out at a good time for her. I also believe, you know, she did so much for this sport. She was one of the first people in the UFC in the bantamweight division. She moved down. She was one of the first flyweights uh, to compete in the UFC. And uh, whether her record shows it or not, you know, she did a lot for the sport in the UFC. So I'm, like, super grateful for people like Jessica I bummed that I never get, uh, got to fight her and get to share the octagon with her. But, um, yeah, it's nice to see her go out on her terms, as she said. People can say positive things about other people, but do you feel like as a fighter, the ultimate respect is actually fighting someone? Um, For me, yes. I would love to fight everybody that I've idolized ever just to test myself. You know, you do this to be the best and you have people that 
you looked up to your entire career and getting to share the cage with them just proves that you're doing something right and that you made it to the point that you always wanted to be at. So for me, fighting somebody that you idolize or that you totally respect is the best part about the sport. And I respect everybody that little bit more once I get into the cage with them as well. It takes a lot to fight somebody else. And I'm very grateful that somebody would give up a fight to me, you know, like get in the cage with me and then uh, go to battle with me. And uh, I'm starting to love it more and more. I used to be very angry because it would take so long for me to get fights. So I think that I ended up taking that out on my opponents. And now that I'm in the UFC and I can get to fight a lot, I have a lot more gratitude for where I'm at and the people that I'm here with and even the people that I'm competing with. There has been, you know, a few retirements in the last couple of events. And one that sticks out the most is uh, Joanna Jenjacek. You know, I mean, she was a, a, a legend. A lot of people consider her a legend. And when you look at how she retired, right, like, she fought Zhang Wei Li for basically a title shot mm -hmm. and she lost and she retired. Is that one of the best ways to go out? Of course, you want to go out as the champion and undefeated, but being at the top of the game and then just dropping the gloves, is that the best way? Um, Yeah, you know, Joanna is my favorite fighter ever. So when I saw her retire, I cried like a baby because I wasn't expecting it. That was one that I really wasn't expecting because, you know, she's so good, like, she got caught by Zhang in that fight for sure. But like you said, it was a title eliminator. The fight beforehand was the best female fight I've ever seen in my life. And other than a couple of people right at the very top, you know, she was still in there and she was still beating up and coming contenders. But I respect it as well and understand why she wanted to go out. Like you said, going out on top is better than sort of becoming this gatekeeper. And I know that maybe she would have fell into that role and didn't really want to have to rebuild. And it's very hard to get to the top once you've had two losses to the top two girls so I understand for sure and I think that she still has a lot to give this sport and I think that she's going to do it in different ways now uh whether it be you know commentating or coaching or just being there for people I've heard from people that I know at American Top Team that she's a really really good teammate so uh I'm sure she'll still be around and a part of the sport all right and uh of course at USC 275 the division that you're part of, the flightweight division, the title was up for grabs. Valentina Shevchenko goes in there, wins a split decision against Talia Santos. How did you score that fight? Watching it live in the fifth, like going into the fifth round, I was like, Valentina is losing this fight. She needs to finish. Like she's going to lose her belt if she doesn't. And then very, very shocked when I heard the scorecards come back that she won the fight, especially 49-46. I think I even tweeted something like, that's crazy. That guy should lose his job. Still stand by that. That guy should lose his job because it's people's livelihood that you're talking about here. And uh, whether he believes Valentina won or not, I don't see four rounds to one in any way. I've watched the fight back since and I can see it going either way. You know, I'm not too mad that Valentina got it, but I definitely think, in my opinion, that Talia won. And I think that Talia just exposed a lot of holes that Valentina still has, you know. I think that MMA is ever growing ever changing and ever developing you've got to change your game you can't stay on top forever having the same game plan so i think that she just exposed some things that valentina needs to work on again and i'm sure that valentina will and i'm sure that the next time we see valentina it won't be as easy to do to her what was just done but i think she put out a blueprint of if you're going to beat Valentina, this is the way to go. So I'd love to see her get a rematch. I know that they probably won't go with that, but I think that she did good and I think she should hold her head high because a lot of people said she didn't deserve to be in there with Valentina and she gave Valentina her hardest challenge ever. So it just proves that it can be done and anybody can be beaten. How big of an impact do you think that headbutt, that headbutt in the middle of the fight? Just I she lost her eye. Crazy. Honestly, I thought that is what changed the way that Talia was fighting. I think she was fighting very, very smart up until that point. And then when the headbutt happened, I feel like she never seen anything coming, getting hit to that side a lot. And Valentina started targeting that side, obviously, as you would. So a lot of scoring was happening because she couldn't really see um, as well. But she still did well when after the headbutt and obviously she's a warrior she didn't want to like sit down and take the headbutt or take a disqualification win or anything and she fought well so i think that it's very commendable how she fought with one eye for sure how, how dominant of a position is is having someone's back you know what i mean and threatening the chose because 
Santos had a few moments in that fight where she was threatening. There was a big threat from the back, you know, on Shevchenko. Well, yeah, they've changed the scoring criteria now. So, like, the most uh, scored thing, I think, is damage, right? So, mm -hmm. obviously, she wasn't getting off as much damage in those possessions. I do believe that uh, back, mount, or mount are the two most dominant possessions. Obviously, back mount with your back upwards instead of down is more dominant than the way she had it which was her back to the mat you can't really generate as much power with punches and stuff like that when your back's on the mat but obviously she was going for submissions when she could and i felt like she was controlling valentina really well and i feel like that's why in my opinion she scored better in those rounds especially those rounds where there wasn't too much damage done mm -hmm. on the feet so I don't know what they're watching anymore. We see it every single weekend. Someone says something about a bad judging call. And I see it every weekend of my own where mm -hmm. I, I see someone win who I didn't think won. Um, I think that they're going to have to do something to change the discrepancy in scoring or at least put out there the proper blueprint to go off of and the standard and change maybe the 10-point must scoring system because I think that that is starting to affect the way people are scoring fights as well so um in terms of back mount i think that's what you asked me it's very yeah. dominant but you have to do something with it i know that she was controlling and i do understand the fact that she wasn't really doing much with it because valentina wasn't giving her much but valentina also wasn't doing too much from the top so um i do believe she should have scored higher than valentina in those positions you mentioned that you would like to see the rematch, and I, I completely agree with you. I think in, in a situation like this, where the fight was so close and, and a lot of people believe the challenger won, I think why not go with the rematch? Especially when Valentina has beaten number one through four already. You know, the next challenger, if they did pick one, would you consider Alexa Grasso? She's number five. She hasn't fought Valentina. Would you put her next against uh, uh, Shevchenko if uh, they don't do the rematch? Um, if I can tell you what I think that the UFC promotion is going to do, mm -hmm. I think that Misha is going to beat Lauren next weekend or this weekend. And I think that they're going to push for uh, Misha versus Valentina. I also believe that if Misha loses, that they would maybe do Amanda versus Valentina again, if, if mm -hmm. Val uh, Valentina and Amanda both win their fights. And, uh, I can't really tell you what they're going to do, to be honest. I don't see them giving it to Alexa Grasso. I think that she'll have to win one more um, unless she gets a finish, which they might give it to her. But I haven't seen too much hype about that. I would, in my opinion, it would be a rematch, Misha Tate or Amanda Nunes for her next. Misha Tate would be a very interesting matchup, especially with the skill set that she has and the experience that she has in, in major fights. Just because what we saw with Santos, that if Misha goes in there, there's a... You know, the odds are going to be much closer than they were, you know, let's say if Santos didn't fight her. I think it'll be super close on the line, but I also believe that it'll be a super close fight when it actually does happen. I've trained with mm -hmm. Misha for two years now, and she's one of the most dominant grapplers, female grapplers I've ever trained with. You know, if she gets on top of you, it's not going to sort of be like the Talia Santos thing. I think that if Misha gets on top of Valentina, it'll be very hard for Valentina to get up. But obviously, if it stays standing, I think that Valentina has great striking technique and nobody can hit her. You know, she's such a counter striker that if you even go in for something, you can get countered. And, you know, she has the ability to finish a fight. So I think it would be a great fight with her and Misha. And I think people would get really excited for that, considering who Misha Tate is. And I would definitely be rooting for Misha in that fight. I love Misha and I hope that she gets a chance at another belt. So I'm, I'm rooting for her this weekend and then I'm rooting for her to get the belt against Valentina. And I just hope that she doesn't want to hold on to it for too long because I'd rather not take it away from uh, Misha. I'd rather fight, you know, somebody else. I don't think I would want to fight Misha if it came to it. There's one thing's clear, Casey, that you will fight anybody for that title. That's true. I would fight my mom for the title and I've told my mom that, I've told everyone that. But uh, there's certain people that, you know, I'm actually really good friends with that I would love to avoid if possible. And unfortunately, a lot of the friends that I keep making are in the flyweight division. So um, I either got to stop making friends with them or, you know, move divisions or just take the belt and deal with it. So uh, we'll see what happens when I'm back. For sure. And what are the doctors saying to you? Like, how long more do you have of just rehab? I actually see the doctor tomorrow morning mm -hmm. for an uh, update, but... 
if everything goes well, I should be back to striking next month and then like striking drilling, boxing drilling. And then within two months of that, back to sort of full MMA drilling. And then maybe two months after that, it's wrestling and jujitsu. So mm -hmm. that's the timeline that they're giving me. I'm on a more aggressive timeline in my own head. So we're beating timelines here. I would say that I'm back fully training uh, or fully drilling by September. Mm -hmm. And then back to live by end of October, start of November, and then fighting in February. That's my timeline in my head. So okay. I want to get back in the cage as soon as possible. I would love to be in there by December, but that's pushing it so somewhere between december and february it's okay, just gonna keep good. getting shorter every time you ask me to <laughs> yeah i know i know your tie light in your mind compared to tie light in the doctor's mind is completely different but i'm pretty sure you guys can meet in the middle somewhere um do you have anybody i know the division changes every month but do you have anyone that you know that would be a good matchup like a fun matchup you know what i mean like it could be ahead in the rankings it could be behind it doesn't matter I want to fight Macy Barber. I feel like me and her would be a really, really good fight. And obviously, you know, she took this fight because I got injured. She's had an ACL tear before. I've had an ACL tear before. We're two up-and-comers, and I feel like it would be a great fight. Um, if not her, you know, there's a lot of fights that are happening right now that uh, are, I'm interested in um, to come back to, you know. So we're just going to see who's in what position when I come back. So I'm obviously ranked number 12 right now, I think. And I would want to fight someone just above me or just below me as I come back. So it'll depend who's in that, you know, 10, 11 or 13, 14 spot when I come back. Um, but there's a lot of names out there and Macy Barber would be a fun one. And I keep asking for it too, because it seems like every interview that gets done by her, she seems like she doesn't really want to fight me for some reason, you know, they'll ask if she wants to fight me and she says, Oh, it'll probably happen, but I feel like it's definitely going to happen. I feel like there's only 30 girls or so in the flyweight division. I think we're all going to have to fight each other. So why not start knocking out contenders now on my way up and prove that I am the best by the time I get up there for the belt? Casey, appreciate the time, you know, giving us an update on, on the knee and, and what's in your mind about the future. Thank you so much and uh, enjoy the, the Vegas heat. <laughs> Thank you so much. Kind of hot, but it's getting better now. <laughs>